to stand and sing together. Let's sing it out now. I kneel at the cross. Oh, Christ will meet you there. Come on. All right, you may be seated, the choir singing, I'll stand for the Lord.
Amen. Thank you, choir. Let's all stand together, try and fellowship one with another. Team choir, you may come up as the adult choir comes down. Amen. So good to see you in God's house tonight. Good to be here and uh, good to be in the dry. Amen. And uh, our church family, most of our church family went over to the funeral home, I would say, uh, for Brother Leon Mosley, a precious, uh, precious man in our church and family connected here for those who don't know. And uh, if you knew him and how sarcastic uh, he was, he's probably laughing that we were getting rained on trying to go see him, you know. <laughs> And I'm sure he had the last laugh on that. But you be much in prayer for that family uh, in Leon's passing. It's home going. He's having a time, I'm sure, and gets to see the Jesus he preached about and sang about. And uh, I'm thrilled for him, but uh, hurting for the family. And let's continue to pray for them, uh, if you would. And I want to read this to you before the Tink Choir sings. We wanted to thank you all so much for the love offering that was taken up for us. Uh, the money given was such a blessing, but the love that was shown through uh, your giving is what touched our hearts. Uh, this summer, we've seen nine souls trust Christ. All of you are a part of that uh, with your love, prayers, and giving. We love you all dearly. And this is from the Butcher family, and we praise the Lord for that. And thank you, church, for giving. And I praise God for your generosity in doing that. And uh, let's hear the teen choir at this time, and then we'll have several more announcements uh, after they finish singing. Stranded souls in darkness, we long to see the light. For 
those who tread a troubled road and feel they can't go on. There's a promise we can stand upon. While walking down a memory lane from paths of long ago, the enemy came by my side, bringing me so low. He brought up thoughts of hurt and pain when I had gone astray. He wanted to discourage me as I walked along my way. And he were undeserving. Cause I know where you have been I have a record of your life When you were bound by sin I know your darkest secrets And that you would never tell What makes you think you don't deserve A place with me in hell And then I heard the old accuser And this was my reply You're right for I've done, I sure deserve to die. My righteousness is filthy rags, my goodness is unclean. There's only one thing I can say to what you've said to me. It's under the given me when I was born again. He washed my stained and guilty past and got new life within. And no longer do I bear the marks that sin had brought my way. With happiness and peace of mind, I'm glad I now can say.
What out of blessings, amen. Amen. Thank you, young people. Tremendous job. Well done. Thank you so much. And thrills my soul. I'm glad it's under the blood. Every last bit of it. And I'll tell you, sins I've, I've and you know, I've, I, I used to get confused as a young man. I remember as a teenager, you'd have some preacher come in and talk about that you had to say you're sorry for every single thing you've done. You know what? I for every single thing I've done. I don't even remember. And guess what? Before you start thinking you're better, either you don't remember ever seeing every ever evil thought that's ever crossed your mind. You don't remember that. <laughs> but I'm glad it don't matter. He covers every last bit of it. Thank God for the blood. Amen. Past, present, and future. Paid for. All of it. And I'm thankful to God, grateful to God for it. I have a few announcements tonight I want to run through before we take our offering. Um, I want to read to you our um, Freedom Kids. And uh, this is Pastor's Office uh, who has gotten the questions right. And I give them the question uh, from the box in the back and they answer it. And then I give them a prize and I'm going to call these names out. They got the question right. Uh, and I'm just going to run through these. And if your name's called, you see Miss Brittany. Tucker, and she's right back there in the very middle in the back, and she'll be down here to my right in her office with candy, and I think it's good candy, too, all right, so you, uh, I haven't tried it, but I'm sure it's good, and I'm going to call these names out real quick, Katie Church, Tanner Heath, Abby Anders, Riley Pegram, Jake Hunley, Kate Hunley, Aaron Tucker, Mason Ritchie, Eli Ritchie, John Hoefling, Ben Bryan, Trinity Scritchfield, Haley Scritchfield, Brooklyn Hill, Madison Anders, Miriam Hoefling, Maggie Church, J.D. Pegram, Daniel Bryan, Luke White, Victoria Pulliam, Owen Follis, Victoria Pulliam, two Victoria Pulliams, and Madison Peters. That's supposed to be the other, the other Pulliam, huh? Maddie? Abby. Abby. I'm going to get it right. I'm messing up every time I say something. Let me just stop right now. Amen. And uh, so the Pulliam girls get candy. Caroline, you want some candy? Just go get it. All right. Amen. All right. And all these folks have gotten questions right, and I thank you for participating in that. Thank you so much. And uh, today is a couple folks I know last service with us, uh, Ashlyn Hutchins and Anna Grace Ingram. Um, and, and Caitlin, too. Is Caitlin going to? Same time? Caitlin? Are you going to? You're not going with them? You're not going at all? <laughs> <laughs> All right, who, who's this? Uh, if, you, if this is your last service and you're a young person going to college, you raise your hand besides Ashlyn and Anna Grace. Anybody else? Those two? I miss anybody? All right. Well, we want to we'll have a time of prayer at the end of the service for you two and uh, thank the Lord for you and want God to watch over you and all of our young people. We're so appreciative and uh, thankful to God for them. And let me give you just a couple more announcements tonight. And we'll move right on with the service. Uh, Saturday morning visitation at 10 a.m. Please remember that and be in your place. Uh, had several folks saved. Miss Linda and Miss Christine Kiger had somebody saved this past Saturday. Is that right, Miss Christine? And uh, somebody I've actually talked to and prayed for. And, and they came in there and, and uh, the Lord saved her. And we praise the Lord for that. Wonderful. And then uh, other folks have been saved. And we praise his sweet name for that and all that God does. And uh, thank him so much for it. And uh, Connor Shaw got saved this week on visitation. And we praise the Lord for that. And uh, there may have been one more that I'm, uh, that I'm overlooking. I know Hudson got saved. And uh, I was trying to think of, of someone else that, that uh, maybe you've mentioned to me. But that's, that's awesome. And we praise God for it. Um, Saturday, August 6th, our teens back to school barbecue at 4 p.m. at the Cerbers. Please sign up if you're will, uh, you'll be attending. Birthday celebration for Brother Clint, Sunday, August 14th, after the p.m. service. This will be in the gym, um, not the Fellowship Hall, and you'll see why if you go over there. Uh, but it, it is uh, pretty much uh, demolition is underway. So we'll have it in the gymnasium on Sunday night, the 14th. So you please keep that in mind. It'll be ladies' uh, safety class Saturday, August 27th at 9 a.m. Please sign up in the back. If you have questions, see Bro Brother Steve Hicks. The Freedom Kids will be participating in a scavenger hunt on August 20th, 2016. Uh, those participating should arrive at the church at 10 a.m. The scavenger hunt will uh, last until 12, and the permission slips are on the table in the vestibule. If you're in interested in sponsoring a college student, we still have room for you, so please uh, sign up in the back 
and uh, we would love to have your help with this. We have uh, more than we have, but we still got a couple spots to fill, so you please do that. Uh, due to the renovations in the fellowship hall, half the gym is set up for the celebration uh, on the 14th, and so the other half will be used, and for ladies' gym night and for Thursday night basketball, there still is a half of gym uh, left for you to participate in, so you don't have to cancel those activities unless you just want to. Uh, but uh, there's, there, I know basketball, that'll be fine because you can go that way. Uh, ladies, I don't know if y'all put the net up or not. Christy, did y'all put it? Okay, okay, well... Uh, it won't be <laughs> it won't be up this time because we got the curtain on. So, uh, but you do have one half there uh, to uh, to play in. I guess play whatever y'all do. I don't know. <laughs> um, let's see. Those who answered the pastor's question, I just read to you. I believe that's it. Praise the Lord. That was a lot of announcements, wasn't it? Amen. You know what that means? We're alive. We got a lot going on. Amen. Fellas, come on at this time. Somebody. All right. Don't leave me hanging, guys. You take an offering. Bob, you saved the day. All right. One more, maybe? Possibly? Come on, guys. Now, we got to be ready for this next time. Amen. All right. Uh, last week, we had missionary Edgar Nono uh, with us. Did a great job preaching, presenting his ministry. And uh, I want to take him on for support if we're able to do that tonight. Also, I'd like to help with the renovations uh, on the, the uh, facilities there that they were doing. And however he sees fit, he had a, a Noah well that needed to be dug, and then he had some renovations that needed to be done. But uh, I'd like to give $1,000 just from the missions account at the church to help in that. Uh, on top of, we'll um, take him on for $75 a month support, and then anything in the plate tonight will go towards the renovations as well. So it'll be 1000 and then whatever comes in tonight uh, will go with that to help with the renovations. And I know that will be a blessing to him. And uh, so you give tonight. He was a real blessing to me. How many of you enjoyed that last week? And, uh, boy, I certainly did. God spoke to my heart. And so and uh, thank the Lord for it. And uh, just trust God will bless him and give him souls for his labor. And uh, let's bow for prayer. Stephen, will you pray for us tonight, please? Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for everything you've given us, Lord. And uh, help us to remember all that you've given us. And uh, thank you for all of our missionaries that we're supporting. And uh, thank you for your daily love and your grace towards us, God. And I ask that you help this offering, help it be used for you. Help be your will to be behind it, Lord. And bless all that's given and bless those who give it, Lord. And that's all that's in Jesus' name. Amen. Great job, Ashley. And let's go ahead and vote on taking Brother Nono on uh, for $75 a month and $1,000 for missions account. And then whatever's tonight, we'll go on top of that. Do I have a motion to do that? Brother Roy Allen, second. Jimmy Smith, all in favor? Okay, any opposed? All right, wonderful. And uh, thank you so much for 
uh, being so generous, and it's wonderful to have Brother Fredericks back home. Amen. And uh, thank the Lord for him. And you pray for him tonight. We're going to bow for prayer and then have the song, and then Brother Fredericks will come with the message tonight. Let's pray. Father, we thank you uh, for allowing us to be here in your house tonight. And Lord, I pray for Brother Jeff, Miss Annette, Miss Betty, Jan, Junior, and Lord, the whole family. God, I pray you'd give them a measure of your grace. You're the God of all comfort, and you are the God of all grace. And I pray you should give them a measure of that tonight. Give them strength. And Lord, I pray that you'll help us uh, to honor you tonight. And Lord, I thank you for the memory of Brother Leon. I pray you'll help us. And Lord, to be what you want us to be. Lord, help us to live our lives in view of eternity. I pray for Brother Fredericks. You'll strengthen him tonight. Thank you for his family. I love him dearly. And I thank you for him. And I pray you'll bless him, anoint him, fill him with our spirit. Use us all now to minister to ourselves. In Jesus' precious holy name, amen. Teenagers, what a blessing, and it is good to be home. I was able to take my wife and I on this last preaching engagement, spoke to a group of teenagers, and they did a retreat in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. I would have preferred more of the coast than a mountainous uh, cabin like they provided for us, but I was grateful for it. Brother Darrell, I felt like that one summer I was the guest preacher for Freedom Baptist Church when I first saw that cabin. I had flashbacks. 
and I was the newbie here, and these guys wanted to welcome me. They knew I grew up in the city, and they knew I grew up with a uh, just messed up background growing up on TV and movies, and I, I just don't do well in the woods and in the cabins. When we took that July journey, Caitlin Fisher was next to me, Brother Chris. We were walking downtown past an alley, just dirt and messy water and just the city. I was like, this is great, huh, Caitlin? She goes, I'd rather be in the woods. And I was like, well, you're more of a man than I am because I'd rather be here than in the woods, sister. And, uh, but it was just, it was, it was serenic. It was beautiful. It was God's nature, but it wasn't me. So I'm glad my wife was there to protect me and uh, my two girls. And uh, we enjoyed being in there, but it was hectic. It was nonstop. And when you go to speak for someone, you're their guest. And uh, we, have an, uh, we have dinner at this time and an evening service to follow in a, in, a, in a little conference room. And then next morning, we want to meet you and have another service. So we want to take you with us. We're going to go sightseeing. Then we want to get you lunch. And we want to take you this afternoon. Then have an evening service. And so when you see us post pictures on Facebook, we're just doing that for our family members to know how we're doing. Uh, don't think it's, ah, Brother Clint's getting a cup with an umbrella in it and just kicking back and not doing anything. I know that's what Preacher White thinks I'm doing, but I promise we're working, and uh, it's good to be home, and it was a blessing to be with those folks. I will say this. I see the baseball bat up here. Is it still up there, Philip, or did you throw it away? Okay. If you went on that July journey trip with us to Louisville, Preacher left the bat there and a Sharpie, so if you have not signed that yet, he wants all of you to put your signatures, not just the teenagers, the chaperones too, so make sure everyone signs that so we can have it, and uh, he'll want to do that. And then let me add to the announcement for the back-to-school barbecue. I want all teenagers to attend. I also want your parents to attend. If only one or the other can make it because of conflicting schedule, that's fine. Just sign your name on there. We'll have a time of fellowship. You know, I was thinking, I was telling my wife, we normally don't get to fellowship much with the parents. We have our four parent team meetings, and those seem to go pretty well, but then most of the time you're dropping your kids off so I can take them somewhere, and then when I bring them back, you're taking your kids back home, and it's like, all right, see ya, you know? And so this is just a fellowship time. We'll meet at four o'clock, we'll eat at five, and you're welcome to come and go as you please. The servers did say you should probably bring uh, lawn chairs of some sort just for recreation, things of that nature. We'll have a few things set up for activities. If some of you want to bring a fishing pole, they do have a pond there that said we can use that as well. So again, a time of fellowship. Let's enjoy that and hope you can be there. So sign up. Tonight will be the deadline. I've got to order all the food and get that taken care of for Saturday and would appreciate if you could help us with that. It was a blessing to go by the funeral home this evening and see a lot of the support from many of you. And many of you have known Brother Mosley and, of course, the Heath family much longer than I have, but it was just encouraging as a pastor to see the, the flock, the membership, taking care of one of their own and praying for them. And uh, let's be in prayer for the service tomorrow. I told Brother Jeff and Miss Annette this. I said, you know, our logic does tell us, our mind tells us he's no longer in pain. He's in a better place, and we understand that. But that doesn't take away the void in the heart that we feel in missing him, and I understand that. So let's pray for this family during this time, if you could. Let's go to the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel's in the Old Testament with all those major prophets, Isaiah, Daniel, uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Daniel in that area. Good to have visitors with us. Thank you for being with us and coming. And I want to encourage you, if this is your first time here, come back on Sunday and uh, hear our pastor preach, and uh, we'll use the same Bible, we'll all do it, lifting up the same Lord, but I want you to meet our pastor and his wife, and, uh, and if you could, be here for that. I'm going to preach on a truth that's been embedded in my heart for the last several months. This is something I wanted to teach my Sunday school class and haven't had time to yet. I did teach it to our teenagers, and the last few camps and teen retreats I've been able to be at, I have preached on this topic, and so it might be repetitive, for a few in here, but uh, it'll help all of us, I believe. Ezekiel chapter number 14, and we'll look at the scriptures here in just a second. But as we get ready to read this, I want us to understand why we're reading this particular passage and what it is getting ready to lead into. Ezekiel was one of the many prophets who were sent to the children of Israel to warn them of upcoming judgment. Saul was the king and disobeyed, and the kingdom was taken from him. And then David was king, and uh, he disobeyed, and the kingdom was taken from him. And Solomon reigned, and he disobeyed, and the kingdom was not just taken from them, it was then rent in two, and it became the northern kingdom and southern kingdom. 
And so then at this time, God is sending prophets by to warn them, saying, come on, folks, can I just paraphrase here? You've seen God punish Saul. You've seen God punish David, a man after God's own heart. You've seen God punish Solomon. What makes you think he won't punish you? And we're getting ready to see a transition here take place in, uh, with this type of uh, thinking of individual responsibility now. And so he uses men like Isaiah to preach to them that the coming of the Lord is, uh, the judgment is near at hand. You better get right. He uses preachers like Jeremiah, known as the weeping prophet, who over a broken heart was able to preach to both the northern and southern kingdom. And then after those major prophets, you have the minor prophets, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. Those men were interspersed throughout the northern, some northern, some southern, and they also too were preaching, judgment is coming, get right, get right, get right. So the preaching has been done by Isaiah, and at 722 B.C., Assyria comes and punishes the northern kingdom of Israel. It wipes out the city, and it kills many and takes several hostage to be slaves. The time of this writing now is 594 B.C., and at 586 is the time in which the southern kingdom winds up being taken over by the Babylonians. Ezekiel is here to preach to them to say, please get right, please get right, please get right. And he's trying to get them to see just how bad off it is. And so that's where we come to chapter number 14 in verse number 12. And the Bible says, the word of the Lord came again to me saying, son of man, when the land sinneth against me by trespassing grievously, then will I stretch out mine hand upon it and will break the staff of bread thereof and will send famine upon it and will cut off of men and beasts from it. Though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, they should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, saith the Lord God. Do you see what he's getting the folks to see here? He wants them to understand that you are going to be punished as a group of individuals. He says if Noah was here, if Daniel was here, if Job was living in this day where you were in 594 B.C., he says only those three would be taken away and saved because of their own personal righteousness. You're still going to get judged. He's repetitive in this, as he says in verse number uh, 15, I will cause noisome beasts to pass through the land and, the, and, and to spoil it so that it be desolate, that no man may pass through because of the beast. Though these three men were in it, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither sons nor daughters. They only shall be delivered, but the land shall be desolate. Or if I bring a sword upon the land and say, sword, go through the land so that I cut off man and beast from it. Though these three men were in it, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither sons nor daughters, but they only shall be delivered themselves. Verse 19, the fourth warning now. Or if I send pestilence unto the land and pour out my fury upon it in blood, so cut off from it man and beast. Though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, as I live, saith the Lord thy God, they shall deliver neither son nor daughter. They shall but deliver their own souls by their righteousness. Father, tonight I ask, Holy Spirit of God, that you would make this truth as clear to these people in the congregation as I see it in my study. And God, I pray, as Paul said, I do not frustrate the gospel for their sakes, God. I pray that my words or an illustration I use would not confuse, but would clearly get us to see the truth here that we as individuals must have personal righteousness. Help us now is my prayer, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Three individual and unique folks in Jewish history. To get the Israelites to truly understand 
Hey, I know we, you know, we all think that 2016 is the worst time ever to be a Christian. But you know there were po folks who their last days were in 1990 and they thought 1990 were the worst days ever. And there were folks who uh, passed away in the 50s and they thought the 40s was as worse. And, man, it's so bad right now. I can't believe what's going on. And many of our grandparents who lived through the 20s and the Depression, and they too were saying, it's so bad, it can't get any worse. I'll just say this, everyone's going to say it's the worst time to live in which the area we live. But we cannot misunderstand, the Bible still says that we're sinned and abound, grace and much more abound. And even here, the grace reaches down to, through a prophet of Ezekiel to say, get right, get right, get right. He says, folks, I want to tell you how, how bad it is for us, not as a corporate group, but as individuals. That if Noah were here, he says, you know Noah. Noah was the one who, who faced the world. And being at that ark exhibit as we were just about 10 days ago, as we took the teenagers I and my crazy youth pastor mind, you know, everyone's driving. I'm like, what are you looking forward to seeing at the ark? I want to see how big it is. What are you looking forward to seeing? I want to see how tall it is. What are you? I just want to see where the housing, where they live. You know, here's me. What do you want to see? I want to know how the septic worked in there. That's how the youth pastor was thinking, right? How'd you get rid of all that junk? And, and then Ken Ham used Jewish history and logic and Jewish building and showed us how the ark probably functioned that way. And it went... Wow, that makes sense. And it was an amazing thing to see. But, but what we can't misunderstand is if you were to stand in the line, we went on an on a, on a, on a, on a easy day. We didn't have to stand in a lot of lines and bypass a lot of stuff I wanted to see. But I read up on it. And if you stand in line there before you get in to take your picture and get into the ark, they do interviews with people they think would have been around at that time, Brother Frankie. And there was one lady who worshiped her God and, and said, we didn't really think that the waters were going to come. It never happened before. And then all of a sudden, the grounds broke up and water fell from the sky. And then that's the last thing I remember. So, you know, it kind of is a, a post-interview from someone they did that way. One guy was interviewed and said, you know, after hearing the same message after 10 years, and then he preached that same message for another 110 years, after for 120 years of preaching like that, you think, man, he's fallen off his rocker. That was the mindset, their thought. It was Noah against the world. It was Noah and his family. And it was just him against the world. And yet because of his faith and his righteousness, God was able to use him to save his family by way of the ark. He believed what he didn't understand then that's where true faith comes in. And he was saying, Ezekiel was saying, even if Noah was here, then a man of great faith like Noah had, who could believe without understanding how the foundations of the earth would be broken up and waters would spew up and how the rain for 40 days would be enough to cover the whole earth. Noah had enough faith to stand against the world. And he said, even if Noah was here, it just be Noah that would be saved because of his righteousness. He says, if you're not getting it yet, let's remind you of another patriarch in our Jewish history. How about Daniel? Daniel, I would say this, would face the flesh. The flesh. Noah faced the world. Daniel faced the flesh. How did he face the flesh? In times of adversity and temptation. When he was taken captive and when Daniel was in the king's quarters and when Daniel is going to be there to have to uh, uh, be one of the Chaldeans who will be used of the Lord as he stands and says, no, I'm going to pray even though the law has been mandated that I cannot pray. With all the politics going on and with all the bills being passed, if someone did write up a petition that stated that public prayers were now against the law, how much would it really affect your life? I tell this to our teenagers, we're guilty of that napkin prayer when we go out to eat. We get our fast food and we're like, okay, dear Lord, bless this food, amen. That's the extent of our Christianity. 
But Daniel said, I'm not, I'm, boy, I tell you what, I'm, uh, the flesh says I've got to obey this, but I also know I ought to obey God rather than man, and I'm still going to pray three times a day. And Daniel was going to say, <clears throat> Daniel would say in captivity that I will not take a portion of the king's meat. And Daniel would say that, hey, you can do what you want to me, but his influence would influence three Hebrew boys who would be tossed into a fiery furnace who also would say, if Daniel can take a stand, I can take a stand too. And Daniel's fight against the flesh help save the boys in the fiery furnace but even if Daniel was there it wouldn't save all of you so we see Noah in his battle against the world we see Daniel in his battle against the flesh and Job and his battle literally against the devil himself the same three temptations that are thrown at us in 2016, the world, the flesh, and the devil. And Job was able to beat the devil out of his friends. And in saying, I know that my Redeemer liveth, and in saying, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him, Job not only refuted those friends of his, who were negative towards him and God, Job was used to stand in between and protect those same friends from the wrath of God. And as great as an individual Christian as Job was, if he was there, he only would have been saved himself by his personal righteousness. So as we see this, let me quickly just help us to go through this historical and then we're done. Really not much, just the truth I want you to see. We're transitioning here. Think with me back in the time of Exodus and even before there as preacher has been preaching from the book of Genesis and he mentioned this past Sunday about the Abrahamic covenant, a promise to Abraham that his seed and the generations that come out for him and the Israelites would be God's chosen people and they would inherit the whole property of the land that is entitled to them no matter what the PLO agreement is they will inherit their whole land when it's all said and done it's a promise made from God this Abrahamic covenant and it used to pray to the God of Abraham, and we prayed to the God of Isaac, and the spiritual blessings came through the family, and the patriarchs of those could pray over blessings. and do. But even in spite of that, there were still prodigals who would go out from our families, but by and large, in most cases, the blessings came as long as you were with the family. Even so educated so well, when that death angel was going to pass over and the firstborn were going to be killed, though they would put blood, they were instructed to put blood in, over, the, uh, over the doorposts and the mantles. And anybody who was in that household would be safe. It doesn't matter, I'm using 2060, it doesn't matter if the firstborn was out playing poker the night before, it doesn't matter if he was drinking with his buddies, it doesn't matter what the firstborn was, because at that particular time, all that mattered was we got under the household and the blessings of the house and the family, and if you were under those doorposts, as the song said, it's under the blood, if you went in there, you were safe. We then were delivered out of Egypt. And when we were delivered out of Egypt now, God used a man named Moses to lead us out. He used a man named Joshua to lead us out. And while they left out of there, in the book of Leviticus, you can read it, and Deuteronomy is kind of a summaration of everything from Exodus through there. They instituted the office of priesthood. And now on a yearly basis, not based on your family's blessing per se, but on what that priest would do on a yearly time at the Day of Atonement when he sacrificed the animal and got the blood and went into the tabernacle and passed on into the Holy of Holies and sprinkled that blood and came out and said, it is finished. And now the blessings came because of the priest. 
So it began with the household blessing. It is now under a priestly forgiveness. And now God is telling them, it's not going to be long. You listen to me. No priest, no Noah, no Job, no Daniel can rescue you. Only you can by your personal righteousness. They are setting up for the coming Messiah. It's not very great. Granted, I know to us, 500 years would be a long, but, but I mean, really, after Ezekiel, you know, it's all, we're into the intertestament, we're into the birth of Christ. And it's getting to where a grandma cannot pray righteousness on you. And it's getting to where grandpa can't pray righteousness on you. And mom and dad can pray for your protection and pray for a hedge of protection around you. Pray for safety as you go about your day. Mom and dad can only do so much, but it's going to be their own decision whether or not they want Christ or not. And that's where we're at today. We have some wonderful families in here. And I don't mean to discourage us, but there's only so much we can do as parents, spiritually speaking, for our kids. Because at some point, they're going to have to get their own standards and beliefs. And yes, while they live under your household, sir, you ought to make sure you bring them to church with you. You bring them to church with you. You don't drop them off at church and go do what you need to do. We all come to church together because a lot of spirituality is better caught than taught. And if we're parents and we just think pushing our kids into a Sunday school class on, at 10 o'clock is going to make them to be a personal righteousness child of God, and that's the only spirituality they see. And on Monday, you guys watch what you want to watch and do what you want to do. And on Tuesday, it's out with the guys. And on Wednesday morning, it's mom out with her girlfriend. And then, oh, yeah, oh, we got to go to church. And we dust the Bible off and we put the kids back in and go right back in and think that a, an hour and 15 minute service on Wednesday is going to help our children to become the Christians that they need to be, we've got another thing coming. You're hoping some pastor can go in and blue do an atonement and pray for your kids and you can say, dear preacher, let's keep this between us, but please pray for my son. Please pray for my daughter and we'll pray and we'll do all we can. But we're not just at the time where a pastor can pray and make your son or daughter become the Christian they're going to be. It's personal righteousness. Ezekiel's the same prophet who says a few chapters later that, man, it's no longer the priest, it's no longer the princes, it's no longer the, pre, uh, the, the prophets. He says, I sought for a man among them to stand in the gap, to make up the hedge, and I found none. Yes, it does take a community. Yes, it does take a church to help us get through this. But it also takes your personal righteousness. You are free to choose, but you are not free to choose the consequences of your choices. Preacher, I want you to pray for this. Okay, I'll write it down. I'm going to pray for it. Now, how much are you going to pray for it? Huh? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. I'm gonna, yeah um, uh, see, you want us to do all the praying. You want someone else to do all the praying for your son, but you're going to have to do some praying and fasting too. They're going to have to hear you pray. Mom, Dad, when was the last time you sat around and had prayer with your son and daughters? And as a family, you all prayed for God to keep you all holy and clean and right and help our family not to be critical and help our family not to look at others and be judgmental. And God, help us to keep our nose in our own backyard and just make sure that I'm the dad and husband I need to be and my wife is the wife and mother she needs to be and that our kids are the brothers and sisters they need to be and the children they need to be. And God, help our family not to be a detriment to, to Christianity and help our family not to be a detriment to, the, to, to Freedom Baptist Church and help our family to be uh, just a help for the cause of Christ to see great things done. It's personal responsibility. Man, your church is awesome. It has, it has, it has pastors, all-stars. It has a youth group. It has this for the, for the college and career. And it has this for the adults. That's awesome, but we can only do so much. It's personal responsibility. How much is your 
personal prayer time. Hey, I, 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 can, I can pull over Brother Roy's Bible, shake it up, open it, and see a bunch of tears in there, see a bunch of notes written down there. I don't mean this bad, Ashton. Brother Roy's Bible ain't going to do anything for you. You're going to have to have your own personal relationship with Christ. And you're going to have to have your own Bible. And you're going to have to have your own notes and your own tears and let the Holy Spirit work in your heart. We can go all through the generations that this church has faithfully had through the years. But Lester Culler can only do so much for Jonathan and Joseph Ellison. As great of a man as he is, and which he has to run that farm and garden and help keep that house and property intact and to be faithful to the house of God the way he is. He can only do so much, Jonathan and Joe. You guys are going to have to make your own choices. You're going to have to get to the point where you might be able to say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I'm not telling you, Mom and Dad, to stop praying. I'm not telling you, Nana and Pa, to stop praying. You keep praying for them, but it might take a little more than prayer. You see, if we can take the time to show them how to turn a wrench and put that alternator in properly to make sure it runs properly, if we can show them how to put that stitch in and that thread into the needle to where it won't come out when you're halfway doing it, and we can make them teach them how to sew, and if we can show them how to make the rows as straight as can be in the garden, if we can do all that, don't you think we also could say, hey, boy, when I read my Bible, here's how I do it. I don't know if it's, but, but it works for me. And so when I read, I try to do it this way, and I just follow along. Because sometimes it's better caught than just taught. It's personal righteousness. Well, I don't want to get in their business. We're in their business and every other thing. Let us mentor our own families. Let us mentor our own children and grandchildren. Let us mentor our nieces and nephews. Let's bring them to church and have them sit with us and hear us shout. I was reading a, a post that uh, Miss Amy had put about being with Grandpa sometimes in church services and when a song was sung that was one of his favorites and being able to know that he was going to shout at any time and, and to have that memory and to know that that was part of Papa's life and in her life that she saw firsthand. Maybe that's why she's trying to create that same thing for her kids too because sometimes it's better caught than taught this personal righteousness Justin can only do so much as much as he's seen brother Daryl it's our own personal righteousness Merle Tamala empty nesters two three weeks I don't want to say your job is done but here we go right we're going to see now that we're grateful that the girls were obedient we're grateful that the girls were doing it when they were home but I hope they still feel that way when they right? It's not easy. I'm there with you. I'll say bye to him again in about three weeks when he gets on that plane and goes out. And I hope he's more than just obedient, but I hope he's starting to create his own beliefs. What do I believe about this and believe about that in spite of his daddy? Because it's all of our personal righteousness. You know, if Noah was a member of our church and Job was a member of our church and Daniel was a member of our church, they would only save Noah, <laughs> Job, and Daniel. Jordan would still have to do it for himself. You see, the grace that was extended to them led to the works that saved them. They weren't saved by works. They were saved by faith and grace and trust. And because Noah believed, his service followed and he built the ark. And because Daniel believed in the vision that he was shown of this great and terrible person whose feet were of brass and thighs of, of gold and, and uh, a breastplate of gold and arms of silver, and, the, and, and as he believed that vision, he saw his actions followed. And the same with Job. When all that took place and the loss of his family, the loss of his fields, the loss of his animals, his actions followed and said, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. Brother Lester Roloff used to say it all the time to young preacher boys when he was alive. You hang on my coattails and ride on my own convictions 
until you get your own. It's about time we as Christians start to get our own beliefs and convictions. Does a person really get saved by their own individual faith? Or does God really pick and choose? Well, it depends on who you're friends with on Facebook or probably what you believe. And which articles they're feeding you and you're reading. But if you read the Bible, you know that he's not willing that any should perish, but that all might come to repentance. And if he just died for some, why did he just partially die? Why do you have to all the way die? I mean, common sense like that. And what about baptism? And what about the type of Bible? Is it King James? Is it ESV? Is it RSV? Is it NIV? Does it really matter? Oh, yes, it matters. What do you believe? Well, I'm a member of Freedom Baptist Church, so I believe, okay, so you believe everything in this church covenant? (laughs) Everything? Well, most everything, except that one, one paragraph about worldliness, but all those doctrine things, yeah, I believe. It's your own personal righteousness. Your holiness is your personal holiness. Your growth as a Christian is your personal growth as a Christian. I'm going to pray for everybody on our church attendance roll. I'm going to pray for everyone in my youth group. I'm going to pray for everyone in our Sunday school class. I'm going to pray for everybody who serves in our church in some aspect. But that only does so much because it's going to be a personal decision for you. Though Noah, though Job, though Daniel. You know, honey, we've done a lot for our kids, but we won't know until they move out what they really believe. Because we've taught them to be obedient. And we've been like many of you. This is our house, and you're going to do it this way. And Yeah, but they get to do Yeah, well, if they jumped off a cliff, would you jump off a cliff? Right? We've done all those cliches that you parents work with. We must teach and train our own house first. We must teach and train our neighbor as our, and love them as ourselves. We must try to help them to see that personal righteousness is something we all need to have in our lives. I'll end with this statement, which kind of spurred me during this study as I saw it. Borrowed beliefs have no passion. Therefore, they have no power. Borrowed beliefs have no passion. Therefore, they have no power. And so if you borrow a belief of someone's, that's only going to take you so far because it's not really your belief. And as a result, it has no power or influence over you in your own particular life. And so, you teenagers? Yes. You sixth graders? Yes. You fifth and fourth graders? Yes. You may live under the house and you may obey those rules, but when you get 18 and start to go on your own, mom and dad can only protect you so much. Mom and dad can only answer for you and back you up. And when the teacher says you, they can only go to bat for you so many times. My child will never do that. But at some point, parents, that that little boy and that little girl's got to grow up and make a choice themselves. You see a parent with their child and the food's put out there. Oh, my, my, my son doesn't want to eat. He doesn't like that. And I know there's still allergies and things of that nature. But, but, boy, how do you know he doesn't like that? How do you know? Well, I just don't want them eating that because I saw who was cooking it back there. La, 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 la. You can only do that so often. They're going to go out somewhere. Man, they were out eating dirt at camp, some of them. Man, I'll tell you what, you're never going to be able to protect them from everything. They're going to have to make their own choices. And let's try to guide them in the right spot so they can. First of all, church member, how about us? Are we where we're supposed to be? Oh, yes, Freedom Baptist Church has been blessed, and next year as we celebrate our 50th year, praise God for that. But you individually, how are you doing? Are you just along for the ride? Oh, here comes the train, man. Look at that train of blessing going on. Oh, yeah. Can I tell you, we could use a lot more people shoveling coal to keep this train going. And the more people we'll have shoveling, the easier it is to get done. And the easier it is to get done, the more spiritual we become because Jesus says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. But we need to make that personal choice because borrowed beliefs have no passion. Therefore, they have no power. Teenagers, 16, 17, 18, you better start understanding what you believe. 
And as I've talked to all of the kids that graduated from our youth group this year, some are going to Surrey, some are going to Forsyth Tech, some are going to UNCG, NC State, Clemson, some are going off to different Bible colleges. And if I talk to them, they've all said this, I've really prayed and I believe God wants me to, and as soon as they say that, I'm like, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. As long as it doesn't violate scripture principle, right? I mean, no one's going to be silly enough to say, well, I've really prayed about it, Brother Jimmy, and I believe God wants me to be a bartender over here at the uh, local uh, Scotty B's right there over on, that's where I believe God wants. That's a violation of scripture principle. I'm going to have to say, wait a minute, let's make sure we understand the same God that we, you know. But all of them have said, I believe God wants me to go there. And it's my prayer that in ABC Bible College and at all these other uh, community colleges, state universities, and so forth, and even those who aren't going off to school, but you're in trade work, and you're, you're now six, months, six weeks into that new place where you're working, I pray that when that temptation comes, and you feel, you feel like you're just you against the world, but when that temptation comes, and it feels that it's you against your flesh and what everyone else is doing around you, and when you're there, and you feel it's you against the devil, that you don't need to watch a DVD movie called God's Not Dead, but that you have some personal righteousness of your own to where you can say, you know, Professor, I, I understand I need to write that down for my test, but that's not in the Bible. <laughs> uh, yes, sir, uh, but I told you on my application, I don't work Sundays. Yeah, well, we just need you one Sunday afternoon. Here's, we had some folks call off. They're not gonna, so if you could come in right after church, maybe about 2 o'clock, then we'll let you go at 5. Well, what's going to happen if the guy who's supposed to relieve me at 5 doesn't call in? If he calls in, then what? Well, then I may need to have you. I don't work Sundays. Could you just do, I, on the application, does it not say I cannot work Sundays? Well, just this one time, man. I thought you were a Christian. Don't you need to help others? Yeah, I need to help myself before I can help others. I need to be in church. Well, then you'll lose your job. It's been a pleasure working for you. Thank you for the opportunity. You don't think God can give you another job? You don't think God could give you some personal righteousness, blessing right about then? God help us to be Christians who understand and live personal righteousness within ourselves. And we can learn to mentor that same thing into someone else. Father, tonight I pray that we would realize how important Biblical history is to teach us these things. We're no longer... Hello, Pastor White here. I want to thank you for tuning in to our live stream today. Uh, whether you watched it live or on YouTube uh, or maybe an archived sermon, thank you so much for taking the time to do so. And I wanted to conclude the message today by telling you a few things uh, about how God feels about you and us in general. First of all, I want you to know today, if you're listening, God loves you. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And that means you, friend. And so I want you to know today God loves you. The second thing I want you to know is that all of us are sinners. We've all missed the mark. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We've all missed the mark, every one of us. The Bible also says in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, But God commended this love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And then in Romans 10, 13, the Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I want to encourage you today, friend. There is hope for you. There's hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you'd like to talk to someone about trusting Christ as your Savior, you can do so. You can reach us at the church here at area code 336-969-6937 or you can reach us on our website at freedombaptistrh.com where we'll have more information about salvation. And we'd love for you to let us know of your decision for Jesus Christ today. If you need prayer, if you need encouragement, please don't hesitate to call or email or visit our website. And we trust that, that you'll find the help needed in the Lord Jesus Christ. May you have a wonderful day. And may God bless you. Thank you again for listening to our broadcast.